We're starting a new um, series today called Shade. Everybody say Shade. Um, It is gonna be awesome. It's on one of my very, 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 very all-time favorite passages of Scripture, and it's Psalm 91. Um, You know, if you grew up in evangelical Christianity at all, you knew parts, if not all, of Psalm 91. Am I right, Christy? Our parents made us quote this backwards and forwards and inside. They were praying it over us. It's the one about angels encamping around you and all the things, right? So they were praying it over us every day, you know? Um, I wanna read you just some quotes about Psalm 91 that theologians have said through the years, um, a man named G. Campbell Morgan said, many have noted the wonderful character of this psalm. This psalm is one of the, of the greatest possessions of the saints. Wow. Charles Spurgeon said, in the whole collection, there is not a more cheering psalm. Its tone is elevated and sustained throughout faith at its best, and it speaks nobly. And then another uh, man quoted in a Spurgeon writing said, it is one of the most excellent works of this kind which has ever appeared. It is impossible to imagine anything more solid, more beautiful, more profound, and more ornamented. So we are, we're basing this series, um, the word shade, off of the actual word shadow that is found in the very first verse of Psalm 91. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But I wanna tell you, you know, um, this is not about throwing shade. You know, if you throw shade at people, you're like, saying bad stuff about them, right? If you're older and you don't know that, somebody says, well, she was throwing shade at me. It is not a good thing, okay? (laughs) The shade that we are talking about is not passive aggressive comments on Facebook being thrown at you that you don't recognize, okay? Um, By the way, you need young people in your life that say, she was throwing shade at you, mom. You know what I mean? So um, shade is usually though a really good word. And this time of year, it's my favorite word, Ron. Um, because if I'm not sitting in the air conditioning, thank the Lord for air conditioning. Pastor Rod just gave him the highest praise today for that, right? Um, I promise you I'm going to be sitting either in my pool or in a shade tree spot, okay? So I just these are some good backyards that I enjoy. This is not my yard, but don't you see, you could just sit there and kind of be comfortable in July-ish, you know? There's another really good shade. Now, this is our yard, and I can tell you right now If I'm out there, I'm in that pool, or you see that shade right there where the pool net uh, stick is, I'm sitting right there. I'm not over here laying out on a towel. I'm not over here in the yard throwing the ball of walker. I'm like, absolutely not. If you wanna play with me, you've got this four feet or whatever (laughs) of space right here that we're gonna play. That's where I live my whole summer is right there. And I was telling my son the other day that he was asking, how do you know if a house is a new house or an old house where you're driving by? And I said, well, you know what? Look at the trees in the yard, right? Because if it's a new subdivision, they took the trees right out to build the subdivision, right? And it takes a long time. We, we um, lived in Florida for 21 years and the last part of living there, we had a brand new house and it was the hottest backyard. And we had a one-year-old who wanted to be outside all the time. We had a pond in our backyard and we, there was no shade. You had like a minute between, I don't remember if it was the morning or the afternoon, that literally, it was literally an hour that you had before you were going to bake to death. And it was my least favorite place we lived because it didn't have any shade trees. So shade is important to me, okay? Everybody say shade is important. All right. Life is just better in the shade, all right? So I'm gonna read you Psalm 91. We're not gonna study the whole Psalm today. We're gonna actually study the first verse. But I wanna read to you Psalm 91 so we can kind of see where we're going in this beautiful work that God has written for us, okay? Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm already there. You know what I'm saying? That's what I want. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen. Amen? Amen. That is power. You don't even need, honestly, you don't even need a sermon preached about it. It's very simple to see. 
But right off the bat, we see that place matters. When it comes to this Psalm, place matters, all right? We're gonna study today Psalm 91, and it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If I'm going to experience all the delicious promises that were just outlined in this Psalm for me, I've got to abide where those promises are found. Now, don't let us shake you up. God's promises apply to you. They are for you. It don't matter if you woke up hungover this morning or what you're gonna do this afternoon. Jesus died to give you an abundant life. But we have this idea, you know, because God loves us and he's so good, until we understand how much he loves us and how stable and trustworthy that love is, sometimes we take it to the other extreme. Well, because God loves me so much, I can do whatever I wanna do. You absolutely can, you can. But the wages of sin is always what? Death, always. Always. Y'all right? So we live in a society that wants the outcome without the process. Right? I want to, I want to have all the benefits of Psalm 91. I don't want to have to live in the shelter of the most high to get it though. Because that's a lot of accountability. Right? That's a lot of responsibility. And again, even though the promises of God are given to us without us having to earn them, there are criteria and parameters that we have to live in in order to experience those promises, right? Listen to this. God's promises are not contingent upon my actions, but they are activated or negated by my actions. Yes. Wow. I'm gonna say that one more time. God's promises are not contingent. That means that they are not, you do not qualify. Like Pastor Allen said so beautifully, you do not qualify or disqualify yourself but I absolutely can negate the finished work of Jesus in my life. Absolutely. The place matters. Say place matters. So it's like this. Somebody could give you Disney passes and you can get the armbands and you can wear them around your house all day. They could be fast passes, park hoppers, the sweetest tickets you could ever get in your life. You can wear them around your house all day long. But if you're not willing to get in the car and drive 11 hours with all your kids to get to Disney, they're worthless. Do you see what I'm saying? I've got to live in the place where his promises are abundant, where they are found and activated in my life if I want to experience them. Hebrews 4, verses 8 through 11 says, so there is a special rest. That sound good to some of y'all? Still waiting for the people of God. A special rest still waiting for you. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. Um, And the King James at verse 11 says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. That word labor means to make haste or do do it diligently. So literally that says, let's diligently pursue that rest. Well, how do we labor to enter into rest? Doesn't that sound counterproductive? That you have to labor, you have to work diligently to enter into a rest. Well, that's because we have a skewed uh, view of what rest actually is, right? I'm gonna just tell you a quick comparison. The world's rest is be lazy, right? God's rest is be fruitful. A tree doesn't strain to make an apple, it just makes it, All right. right? It rests in its purpose. The world's rest is do nothing. God's rest is be something, right? The world's rest, I deserve this. God's rest, this is a gift to you, right? The world's rest, there must be peace so I can rest. God's rest, you sleep through storms. That's what Jesus did. He laid down, he was showing us something. You know that, right? He wasn't just sleepy. He was laying down to show us, this is the kind of peace I came to bring you. That you don't have to wait for the water to be calm to be at peace and to be at rest, okay? Second Corinthians 2, 5 says, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the wow. anointed one. Come on. So the struggle isn't with rest itself. The struggle is in our minds differentiating between how the world system works and how God's kingdom works right? All right, let's look at our verse again. 
Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We're gonna talk about two things today. We're gonna talk about dwelling. We're gonna talk about abiding, okay? So God is inviting us to number one, dwell in the secret place of the Most High, all right? That word dwell means to make a permanent residence, to inhabit as a home, okay? It implies I'm not living out of suitcases anymore. I'm hanging my pictures on the wall. I'm unpacking my stuff. I'm making this place mine. I'm living here. I'm not moving. I hate living out of a suitcase so much. We've got youth trips coming up this summer. I'm already dreading the chaos that comes with the suitcases. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, and nobody knows. I'm, okay, I'm gonna be nice. Thank you, Lord. But <laughs> some people in my family don't know how to nicely just get out one shirt. They have no idea how to do it. <clears throat> Rod's better about it than anybody else, I'm gonna tell you that. So it's one of them kids, all three of them maybe. All right, so this is where I'm living and I'm eating and I'm sleeping and I'm growing, I'm dwelling in this place with the Lord. It's home, okay? Everybody say home. God wants the secret place next to him to be home to you. Not something you visit on Sunday or at Elevate. He wants it to be home to you. That, now, he said that we dwell in the secret place of the most high. Most high means the supreme one over all. He's not over some things. He's over all things, okay? Acts 17, 28 says, for in him we live and move and exist. Another version says, in him we live and we move and we have our being. That's where I actually live is in him. We don't just visit him every once in a while. He's not our summer getaway or our favorite vacation spot. He is home. That's where we're supposed to live. It's God's kingdom. And let me tell you something. You will never find your true existence outside of Jesus Christ. You will not find it. You will not find it in your career. You will not find it in a number in your bank account. You will not find it. Single people, listen to me. You will not find it in him or her. You will not find it. You will not. If you want to be married, God wants you married. He gave you that desire. He will fulfill it. But I promise you right now, if there is a gaping hole inside of your heart that only God is supposed to be filling while you're single, it's going to be even emptier when a husband or a wife sucks the life out of you. Do you hear me? Singles, married, teenagers, dreamers, wherever you find yourself, there is no there there. It's here. The kingdom of God is here now, okay? Colossians 3, verse 2 through 3 says, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life. I love this so much right here. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, your real life isn't found in your career. Or It's funny when people see us out in public and they always act like, wait, y'all shop like y'all grocery shop? Like y'all think we live in the building? Like, do y'all think that we just sit around and trust the Lord to bring our food by birds or something? Like, of course we have to, we go to grocery stores. We use toilets. We have to wash our clothes. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that of, of, wait, you have an existence outside of here, but I want it to be said of me at the end of my life, she had no existence outside of her relationship with Jesus. It's all she did. It's all she carried. It's all she talked about. Everything she did was permeated by that relationship with Jesus. I want to be hidden in that all my life, yes. right? Yes. Proverbs 25, two says, it is the honor of God to hide a thing and the honor of kings to search out a matter. In other words, God likes to hide things. We like to find things, right? Um, I had that on my heart so much this week and I actually listened to a sermon that got this, this triggered in me even more, that God doesn't hide things from you. He hides them for you, okay? And this is the concept. It, as, as a parent, I'm the Easter egg hider at our house. And so Easter is always at our house. We always go to my house and my whole family, not my parents, Lori and Seth and their kids. And it's all of our kids. And so I, the night before, have gone in the yard and I've hidden eggs all over the yard. And each kid, usually I wasn't this organized this year, but I usually give each kid a color, like legend, you're blue, Lennon, you're pink, Walker, you're green, or, you know, the four littles. And depending on their ability, I'm gonna find a place to hide Walker and Legend. And Cash is a little more, a little harder, more obscure than I am London's, who's gonna cry if she don't find all of them within a minute. You know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna put hers in a little bit of an easier place. I'm not hiding them because I don't want them to find them. <sighs> I'm hiding them because it delights me to know that they found it, right? 
Let's read this again, Colossians 2. Um, Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's read again, Proverbs 25. The honor of God is to hide a thing. The honor of kings is to search it out. Let's read Psalm 91 again. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God wants you so hidden in him. You know why? Because it delights his heart when you are finding those Easter eggs about yourself that he has hidden only in him for you to find. You're not gonna find them everywhere else. I'm not saying you shouldn't go for it. Go for it. Like, go for the degree. Go for the career. But all of that are the Easter eggs that he has tucked away for you. They are not the answer, right? You start finding, where do we live? In him. We move in him. We have our being, our existence in him. So on my best day, on the best accomplishment I'll ever make in my life, that was something he tucked away in his ability for me to find, right? So there's a secret place with him. Everybody knows about Rosie's Mexican, right? Everybody. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's like my least favorite Mexican place to eat that I've eaten at. It's okay. I'll eat there. They've got great queso. I like their queso. It's fine. But it's, it's not real Mexican food. It's not Mexican. It's not. It's not. It's okay. It's okay. Don't be mad at me. But I am kind of an official Mexican expert. So, um, kind of a big deal. So, in Florida, there were a couple of main places like that where we lived. There was such good Mexican food in Central Florida. And there were places that were like mainstream, like Rosie's or Phil's or whatever. And then we discovered a place called La Mandarina. And it was literally a little hole in a wall building on Orange Avenue in Eustis, Florida. And we would take like people who like Rosie's to it. And they'd be like, this is the nastiest thing I've ever seen. My and it was not nasty. It was the best. Y'all, I'm telling you. So Rod and me and Lori and Seth, I mean, I, it's probably too many times a week, we're going to get their real tacos. Not the ground beef tacos, the real tacos. You know what I'm saying? The real salsa, the chipped beef. Oh my goodness. So I grieved leaving that. Like we still haven't found that place. Lori loves the taco truck, by the way, on you know County Line and 72. It's good. But we haven't found our La Mandarina Yeah, because, and let me tell you something. We found something. We weren't telling everybody to go there. It was our secret place. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to wait all day for a table because we told everybody, go there, right? Right. You know what? It wasn't wasn't something everybody was going to like or understand. You know where I'm going with this, right? There's a secret place that God has for you that a lot of people in your family are going to go, that's the craziest thing you've ever done, Right? And you're like, but I'm going to tell you something. I've eaten here, and they're the best tacos I've ever had in my life, and I've never been sick one time. So, right? The secret place God wants to take you to is for you. It's not the secret place for your brother-in-law. It's not the secret place for your spouse who doesn't understand. They've got their own secret place with him. This is your secret place. It's you that God invites to taste and see that he's good. It's you that he invited, come inside this place, crawl inside this place with me. At Jack Camp, which we go every year, um, there, we discovered a secret place um, at Jack Camp because, you know, there's a lot of teenagers at Jack Camp. So we found a little secret place. And I want to show you, it's called the Green Cathedral. This is the path going down to it. And it's like, y'all, it takes, I don't know how long it would take to walk it because we have a golf cart while we're there. So <laughs> we drive the golf cart, but it, it's so far down and like the, the temperature changes, it gets darker down there. There is no cell phone service whatsoever. It is so quiet. And if you were walking it, it's, it's going to take a while. I don't know how long. I'll, I'll find out if, I, if our kids do it this time. But this is what you get when you get to the bottom of it. It's literally, you cannot hear a sound. You can't hear the road traffic. You can't hear anything but the birds and maybe fish scuttling across the water every once in a while. It's a secret place. I ain't telling, I mean, your kids are going to hear it if they watch this sermon, but I'm not telling all those kids about this. It's mine, right? God has places like that hidden in your heart. It's just a track to get there sometimes for ourselves, right? I know I'm dwelling in the secret place, though, when I take ownership of my life. What does it have to do with the secret place? Well, I stop seeing myself as a victim, and I only identify with him, right? I don't get any gold stars for just doing my part in the secret place. Mm Mm-hmm. We were watching a movie though, on that side note, um, Mitchell's versus the Machines. Y'all seen that on Netflix? And the mom is like giving gold stars out to everybody for everything they do. And Walker says, hey guys, here's something our mom's never done for us, you know? <laughs> like, dead coming, I ain't gonna start either. How about that? All right. 
Here's another way I know I'm dwelling in the secret place. I protect that place. Listen, I'll be merciful to you all day long, but you come to my house, start threatening my kids, I'm gonna light you up like the 4th of July. Literally, I'm gonna light you up. You understand? Like, I'm going to protect that place. This place that I have with God is mine and his. And I'm not, I'm not defending, it's one of those things, I'm not on a rampage against people, but I'm tearing, what did it tell us to do? To tear down every imagination and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and tries to keep me out of that place with him. I'm gonna light it up and expose it and get it out of the way, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the secret place, I can be my real self, yeah. not false confidence. <laughs> false confidence, well, this is where I am, so take it or leave it. You just, I'm, this is the way I am. I've been this way all my life. Most of the time, people who have that kind of attitude are just difficult. They don't have any friends, so that's how they cope with it. I've been there. You know what I'm saying? I'm a recovering excuse maker. Been there. But in this place, I can be my real self and say, you know what? This is who I am. I don't like everything about myself. I'm growing. I'm changing. I'm becoming, right? But I'm safe here to, to make those mistakes in the secret place, Right? Here's another way I know I'm in the secret place. I have a seat at the table. I know I have a seat at the table, right? No one can kick you out of your spot in God's kingdom, y'all. Listen, listen. No one's opinion of you. Nobody's. I don't care if it's your grandma who saw Jesus face to face in her prayer time. Not even her opinion is strong enough to change your position in the kingdom of God. It's not possible. It's yours. But let me tell you something. Sitting at the table doesn't guarantee that I get to decide what we're going to eat. Right? You ever sat down at God's table and you're like, I hate this. I do not like this. Like a big bowl of celery. You know what I'm saying? I hate celery. I hate it. I would, I would rather eat grass out of the yard. I'm being serious. But sometimes you sit down at his table and he's like, well, guess what, kiddo? Today you're eating celery. Right? I don't get to decide what we eat just because I have a seat at his table. All right, number two. This is the next part of that scripture. We abide, if we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That word abide is quite different from dwell. I thought they were the same. It's not. That word abide means to wait in a continued place, to remain fixed, to endure, and to bear patiently. Oh, so it's different from dwell. See, dwell and dwell, we are building our life in the secret place of the kingdom of God. It's big and it's expansive and, and he calls us and there's purpose and direction and we go to church and we go on trips, mission trips, and we fulfill our calling on our life and we, it's, all, it's so big, right? And we can just wander around in God's kingdom and listen to his voice, right? But then um, th that's like the secret place. But then dwell means, you know, like your house is pretty big, but that kid finds you and sits right next to you. You're like, we've got 3,000 square feet in this house and you have to be touching me with your hot, sweaty feet, right? <laughs> Them kids be piling up on you all the time. It don't matter if it's your nine-year-old or your 27-year-old, they gonna lay on you on the couch. You know what I'm saying? And if physical touch is not your love language, I feel you today. <laughs> like you, Whew. all right. All three of mine have got it somewhere in there, that, that touch thing. But abiding is, where is mom in the house? I want to be next to her, right? I get it that we've got the whole house, or I get it that we've got the backyard and the pool. We got all of this that you provided for us, mom and dad, but I want to be right next to you. I want to be right where you are. Just like a house with many rooms, I want to know where he's sitting and go sit next to him. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. So remember, abide means to wait in a continued place, to be patient. Abide is my position right next to him. Have you noticed that it's not easy to be patient just because you trust? Right? I was talking about this to the Lord this week. Like, God, I know you're trustworthy. It never crosses my mind that you're not trustworthy. And I was being a little arrogant about it, apparently, because he said, mm, let me tell you something. Your ability to be patient for me to fulfill my promise is directly tied to your trust in me. Oh, okay, I won't say any more that I think you're trustworthy then because I definitely don't trust you in a couple of areas because I'm trying to speed it up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Did y'all watch The Chosen, the last episode, by the way, when John the Baptist was like, I mean, when are you gonna get to the whole thing? Like, 
you're preaching in these little towns, Jesus, and we're here for you to like slay dragons, you know. And Jesus is like, you just take your time, boy, do it your way. I'm doing it mine, you know. You know, my, I'm going to say it again because it hurt my feelings, so you deserve to hear it too, that patience <laughs> is directly tied to the amount of trust I have in him. If I really trust him, it won't matter if it takes 10 years. So abiding means I'm sitting so close to him like John did at dinner that night. I can hear his heartbeat, right? I'm, I'm laying my, shoulder, my head over on his shoulder. Remember one of the definitions of abide is fixed. It's reminding my soul. I don't care what my eyes see or what my feelings feel. I'm not moving my confidence or my expectation away from his promise. Do you know that obedience is proof of love? Hmm. Yes. John 14, Jesus said this, do what you want to do with it. He replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. Wow. And remember, my words are not my own. I'm only telling you what the father has said to me, right? So they're probably getting mad and he's like, hey, uh -uh, no, 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 no. I'm just telling you what he said, right? Obedience is abiding. Wow. That's what it is. Wow. It's the posture of, Lord, I will sit right here next to you, close enough to be caught in your shadow at all times. Where you go, I go. When you move, I move because I want to abide. I want to patiently wait right here in your shadow, right? First John 2, 6 says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Well, how did Jesus live? Connected to the Father, right? First John 3, 24 says, those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him. That's what I want to do, but I don't want to obey his commandments bad enough sometimes to remain in fellowship with him. You know what I'm saying? And listen, it's not, again, it's not contingent on me. I'm going to say it again. His promises are not contingent on my choices, but I either can negate or activate them by my choices, right? First John 4 says, all who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them and they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Yeah. Abiding is proof of our love. Obedience is proof of our love. Wow. Let's talk briefly about abiding under the shadow of the Almighty again. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Shadow implies I'm close enough for him to reach out and snatch me when I need it, yeah. right? It, it definitely breaks the six-foot-apart the six rule. I'm in his shadow. I'm right next to him, Right? Listen, don't, don't get confused. You're as close to God in righteousness as you will ever be. You're as righteous as, as you can ever be because of the sacrifice of Jesus. But we are called to live godly lives by choice. So we look like him because we choose to, right? That word almighty, living in Shaddai's shadow or almighty shadow is the word Shaddai. Almighty is another word for Shaddai. And that word Shaddai means the overpowerer that I live so connected to him that his shadow overpowers all of these things that I'm worried about. He's the, you know why he wants you close to him? You can't sit that close to him and still stress about the stupid stuff we stress about, right? That I'm so confident because of the giant next to me, Shaddai's closeness overpowers all the fear and the dread I had in my life. When I abide, I stay with patience. Here you go. I choose to obey, I choose obedience over agenda. You want me to love who? I'm sorry, what? Sometimes you just need to sit down and realize you're not here to change everybody's mind. You're here to love and be loved. That's what you're here to do. And you're not here to change everybody's mind. But if I obey Jesus and I do what he's telling me to do, he can change the hearts and minds of people around me that need to be changed, right? When I abide, I stay with patience. I trust that he sees what I cannot see. When I'm abiding, we won't say things like, yeah, but when he tells you to do something, right? right. Doesn't it crack you up that we sit and we actually try to help God be God? It's one of my favorite things that we do. I do it all the time, all the time. He'll say, I want you to you know, tell so-and-so this. I'm like, yeah, well, I know that she just had a really bad week last week, so... Yeah, I know she did. That's why I'm telling you I need you to say this today, right? Thanks. Thanks, kid. Like, I appreciate you. Your spot in the kingdom is important, but it's not my spot, right? Yeah. Like we're ever going to bring up a fact that changes his mind. Where he's like, oh, you're right. I didn't think about that. Let's give her a couple of days, right? 
Not once. I have tried, y'all. I've tried in every way possible sometimes to change his mind. He has never budged. I'm so thankful. Here's another thing when I abide. I bear fruit. John 15 says, abide in me and I abide in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he said it like this, I am the vine. Just so we're clear, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Who bears much fruit? When we abide in him and he abides in us. Yes. That's when we bear fruit, right? Yes, 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 yes. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. Uh -oh. And they gather them and throw them in the fire and they're burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, by what? Abiding, by us patiently waiting next to him. By abiding, my father is glorified so that you bear much fruit and you will be my disciples. How does fruit grow? By abiding by staying connected to the tree. The apple can't decide when it just gets the form of an apple, it's time for me to jump off of here. That's not how that works, is it? Listen, it's saying, well, I mean, I'm working on my relationship with Jesus. I don't know why or nothing's changing. I go to church every Sunday. Well, that's like saying, I can just throw an apple seed into an orchard and it's just gonna grow, right? It's in the location, it should grow. It's more than that. It's nurturing and tending, right? It's something that has to be active and proactive in our life. Here's another thing about abiding. When I'm abiding, I live in alignment with Jesus. You know, I don't know how often Rod aligns the wheels on our car. I mean, how often do you do that? Whenever it needs it, he said. You're supposed to do maintenance on vehicles. I don't, I don't know. I went straight from my dad to Rod. I have no idea. So if a light comes on, I call a man. Sorry. So anyway. You're supposed to take your cars in to get your, your tires aligned, right? Because, you know, if your tires aren't aligned, you don't wanna be going 75 miles an hour down 565 and eating a hamburger, right? Because you're gonna see Jesus real quick after that. You got to keep your hand on the wheel and it's bumpy and things feel, you know, you're like, oh no, this doesn't feel right, right? That's my signal to be like, call Rod. Why is my van shaking? Like, you know, but Sometimes when you're shaking your attitude, your patience, your um, communication with your family and it's wobbly and you're drifting, you're like, it's time for an alignment, yeah. right? It's time for my attitude to get in line wow. Wow. by abiding with him, yeah. by getting right back next to him. You know, my kids, um, when they want to sit next to me, they will all move my arm, whatever it is I'm doing, and push my body to the shape they want it to be so they can fold right in to where I'm at. But I'm gonna tell you something, if they don't, if they're upset with me, and I try to hug any of the three of them, they will limp their arms like this. And you're standing there holding like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, no, 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 no. Y'all are all touchy, touchy, right? So put your arms around me and squeeze me hard. Let's go. And they're like, oh, man, I'm so mad at you right now. You know what? It's easy to abide with him when you want something. It's easy to abide with him um, when you're happy with your life and you got that surprise check in the mail, right? It's real easy to abide with him when everybody's behaving and I'm healthy and the numbers are right. And you know, it's, that's easy to abide. But what about when his answer is no? Because you, he can see what you can't see or uh, when he has to discipline you or correct you or he speaks to you through someone else who loves you, who speaks correction into your life and it hurts your feelings a little bit. It's hard to abide with him then. It's hard to get right next to him then. Or what about when he says, not yet, I want you to wait. You're like, <laughs> right? <laughs> One of the most heartbreaking uh, passages in scripture to me is Matthew 23. And we're gonna close with this. Jesus is drawing to the end of his ministry and he speaks this over the city of Jerusalem. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you are the city that murders your prophets. You are the city that stones the very messengers who were sent to deliver you. So many times I have longed to gather a wayward people as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were too stubborn for me. And I wonder how many times I've been in a train wreck of a pattern in my life and I've, I've been just in a real broken place. And he has said, oh, Jill, 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 how many times I wanted to gather you together this week and bring you to myself, but you wouldn't let me comfortable in my sin or the laziness or the complacency or the attitude or, you know, the power I thought I had by making somebody suffer for what they did or, you know, whatever it is. Too proud to admit I need help, right? 
You know, a mother hen, he, I love it that he used this analogy because she is a force to be reckoned with. She is a dangerous creature if she wants to defend her babies, right? If she perceives that they are in danger from an animal or a human um, or the weather, like if, you know, a baby chick, if it rains on a baby chick, even in the summer, they can lose so much body heat within just minutes that they can die of hypothermia. Like they, they're so tiny. She knows that. So in those times when there's danger or weather or whatever it is, this is what Jesus is talking about. She pulls them right next to herself. Look at this picture. I think this is one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. She's willing to face it. She's willing to take it, right? She's willing to stand there in the, in the weather, against the animal, against whatever it is, as long as she can keep those babies tucked in underneath those wings, which by the way, were designed to do that right there, yeah. right? That's how chickens survive and we have Chick-fil-A on Monday. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's because <laughs> that's how, because mama said, not today, Satan. No, 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 no. You're not gonna touch my babies, right? I'm a mother hen. I get it. Where I'm like, I'm telling you, I'll light you up. I will light you up. You will forget I am a pastor if you mess with my kids, right? In, in love, of course, in Jesus' name. So would you just leave that picture up there, Yvonne? I think that's you. Is that you? No? Who is that? Is it Atticus? Hey, Atticus. Okay. Will you leave that up? All I can see is dark hair, so I can't see your head. Guys, those people are heroes up there. You have no yeah, idea. Um, yeah, I want you to look at that, and I want you to think if he said your name. Oh, Jill, Jill. Honey, how many times I wanted to just pull you to, to me like a mother would pull her babies under her wings and protect you till this is over and keep you warm until this is over. I would do anything, anything, anything to protect my kids from pain, anything. There is nothing. I would not financially pay. There's nothing I would not give off my body. There's not an organ in my body that matters to me when it comes to my kids. There is nothing I wouldn't do for them, but my human ability is limited. And there is a part, a part in your life, and every parent, you faced it, where you go, I literally can't do anything else. There's nothing else I can do except pull you close. Let me tell you something. Jesus is, this is why he used that example, that protection for you. That secret place is that for you. Or when everything else is, it, you're vulnerable and you're exposed and you feel like I'm going to, this is it. This is where I go down right here. He's like, Jill, Jill, this is where I want to pull you closer than you've ever been next to me. You know, when my kids are hurting, I want them to abide with me. When they're lost, I want them to abide with me. When they're angry at me, I want them to abide with me. When they're afraid, I want them to abide with me. But we wanna speed things up and get it over with, right? Like, I wanna move on with this. I want this pain to be over. I want this place to be closed in my life. And God's like, listen, there's just some things that we can't close unless you're sitting right here next to me on purpose. There's just things I understand about you that nobody else understands about you, right? He wants to pull you close. Again, don't, don't, don't confuse what I'm telling you with your righteousness. You're as close in righteousness as you'll ever be to Jesus. You are worthy because of the finished work of Jesus. But if we want those promises activated in our life, we've got to let him pull us close. Yes. Yes. Intentionally, uncomfortably. That does not look comfortable for those babies, does it? They're probably like, come on. I mean, have you ever tried to hold a kid like on an airplane <laughs> or anywhere? They're like, put me down. You're like, not yet. I cannot put you down yet. You've got to stay here. Abide. That is what abiding is. When you're going, put me down, Lord. He's like, you wait a minute. You don't know what I know. Sit right here next to me. This is, listen, do you remember that song? The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. Remember that back in the day? The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. My youth pastor in high school sang, the safest place in all the world is the will of God. He would sing that over and over. The safest place in all the world is the will of God. And that stuck with me for a million years now since I graduated high school of God, I get it. I'm uncomfortable being pulled right here next to you for right now, but this is the safest place I can be. Yes, yes. I can trust you, Lord. 
Lord, we want to trust you more. We want to, we want to be able to trust you more. I know that that's such an obscure thing. It's something that may be hard for us to put our hand on. Is a trust in a God that we cannot see or maybe that we didn't grow up knowing or experiencing in our daily life. But here we are in this place. And some people I know, like I know my name, you had a light switch moment today where you're like, you know what? That's the problem. I do believe in Jesus. I love serving the Lord, but I am not abiding and being patient in that place with him to let him work out in me what only he can work out in me. So Lord, we just let you this week pull us close. Lord, make us uncomfortable. If it's uncomfortable, we're, we're ready to be uncomfortable. We've been comfortable in this place we're in too long. So I ask you, Father, um, just to give us a, a new mercy, a new ability to let you just pull us close and see what we can't see and protect us from the things that are hurting us, but to work a change inside of our heart that only happens in that secret place. Lord, we want every one of those promises that we read today out of Psalm 91 manifested in our life. We want to live in Psalm 91 in our life. And it, you made it very clear that the key to that, to all those promises is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. If we can do those two things, y'all, those two things right there, unlock all the promises that Jesus died to give you, dwelling in his place and, and abiding right next to him in his shadow. So in your own way, just make that decision. I just, I lay down my agenda, what I thought this should look like, how I thought this should go, and I submit myself to you. Let you pull me close and I will wait. And if the answer is no, I will, I will trust you that you can see what I can't see. And if you're here and you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life or you're watching um, this later or you're watching it live right now, we wanna give you the opportunity to do that. It's the most important thing you'll ever do in your whole life. Let's just pray this simple prayer together. Say, Jesus, I believe you came into this world. You lived a sinless life. You took my sin. You took my judgment. My past is gone. My future is spotless. I call you my Lord. Amen.